Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. Welcome to 2024, everyone. I hope you had a wonderful holiday season, and I'm so excited to usher in the new year with a conversation on what, if you've been listening to this podcast, you know is my all-time favorite topic, Roman politics. And there's no one better to discuss it than our guest today, Professor Jed Atkin, who is the E. Blake Byrne Associate Professor of Classics at Duke University. He specializes in Roman politics and especially in Cicero. In this conversation, we're going to discuss the ways in which Roman politics should seem familiar to us and yet are fundamentally different, how the founding fathers understood the Romans, and of course, Cicero. So with no further ado, I hope you enjoy. Jed, welcome to the show. It's a real delight to have you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Annika. So I want to kick us off here. Um, Before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of this, Um, I'm very curious, in your latest book from 2018, you talk a lot about the difference between the familiar and the foreign when we look at the ancient world. Um, And I think it's so important because I think people are very quick to say, oh, well, if what happened in Rome or Greece doesn't immediately relate to what is happening to us now, then I'm not interested and I don't care. Um, So can you talk a little bit about why that's such an important distinction and particularly what kind of cultural assumptions that might be surprising to people the Romans had that informed their governance? Yes, that's a great uh, first question and a very important distinction. Uh, You know, so often I think uh, we do get interested in a regime like Rome because uh, we do um, see that there's... Uh, there are some ideas that seem so very familiar to us. And as we'll talk about a little later on, uh, that comes from some intuition, some ways of thinking that are deeply embedded in uh, the American political tradition going all the way back uh, to the 18th century. Uh, but uh, the problem is we just turn to ancient political theory to find uh, the things, uh, ideas that are familiar to us, uh, things like uh, individual rights. Uh, then what we'll simply do is have a mirror. We'll find when we look at Rome, we'll just simply see our own reflection in a mirror. And that doesn't help us. It doesn't help us understand the Romans. And it also doesn't help us uh, use Rome to do normative uh, political theory because uh, because after all, we'll just find uh, what we already believe. Uh, and so I uh, suggest that when you study the Romans or for that matter, uh, the Athenians, it's important to keep into uh, mind uh, uh, two things. Uh, number one, uh, there are familiar concepts uh, such as uh, individual rights, or uh, as another another uh, concept that I'll talk about in the book is is toleration, religious toleration that emerged uh, in the Roman Empire uh, under Christians. On the other hand, there's also uh, concepts that are very foreign to us, or at least that we don't think about uh, as often, we being uh, liberal uh, uh, w- liberal in the sense of uh, people that are committed to individual freedom and rights, uh, th- things like honor and status. And so I suggest that the best way uh, of thinking in, about the Romans, uh, both best because it helps us treat our history well, but also opens up the space uh, to do a critical reflection of our own time and place is by holding uh, tension uh, between the familiar and the foreign, uh, the Roman uh, emphasis on uh, on things like status and hierarchy uh, and honor, uh, as well as uh, things that are more familiar to us, uh, such as such as rights. Because after all, when we get this distance, uh, we can see uh, more clearly uh, uh, areas in Roman thought, in Roman life, that might be more blind uh, in our own culture and life. I think we kind of just tossed in a, a lot of words there, uh, you know, hierarchy and honor versus rights. Um, and one area where I think that is especially kind of interesting is foreign policy, because I think that we have kind of this conception of, oh, well, once you take out like a humanitarian or a Christian view, all that's left is realpolitik. Um, and as you point out, uh, when you take out um, a humanitarian or Christian view, that that's actually kind of not the case. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that and about how this idea of hierarchy and honor really impacts the way the Romans think about their governance? 
Well, just war theory, uh, which has been so important in Western uh, political philosophy, certainly in the Christian tradition, uh, the Catholic tradition, uh, and then resurrected uh, and, and defended in modern uh, political theory by uh, Michael Waltz or Justin on Just Wars, yeah. and has been evoked uh, by uh, and informs much of American uh, foreign policy. Uh, this just war theory was first articulated in Rome. Uh, with Cicero. Uh, and, uh, and just war theory simply understands uh, that uh, and holds that you have to give a justification uh, for going to war and using violence. And you have to give a justification for why you should go to war. And then you also uh, have to conduct war uh, according to certain uh, principles and within certain constraints. Uh, and this uh, view of warfare uh, that Cicero uh, argued and defended uh, came out of an understanding of, uh, of, of law that required restitution. In other words, you have to uh, properly declare war and say this is the reason why uh, I'm going to war because you have uh, taken something from me or from uh, my allies uh, and therefore uh, you have injured me uh, and this injury is severe enough that... Um, that uh, it warrants the use of violence in order uh, to recover that. Now, what's so very interesting in this account is that it is one that's made out of both justice, uh, but also as war gets conducted, honor uh, plays a very important part in ancient warfare. And um, in Cicero, in his On Duties, which he a work that he wrote at the end of his life, it was a work that was written uh, from Cicero to his son, who was a college student uh, at the time, you might say studying abroad in, in Athens. And and um, in, in this work, he, he's arguing uh, for all the things that rising uh, statesmen should follow, all of the, the principles and, uh, and code of ethics. Uh, and there, uh, Cicero sets out uh, an account of ju the justice of war, uh, but he also uh, wants to bring uh, into conformity with this code of just war honor. And, and he is uh, very cognizant of the fact that war is waged by people in the name of honor and often fought by people who love status and who love honor. Uh, warriors often mm -hmm. follow a code of honor. And what Cicero tries to do in De Ficis is, is use this honor code to restrain war uh, and to restrain the kinds of actions that one might do in warfare. Uh, there's some things that you wouldn't do, not just because they're wrong, but because they're beneath your status as a right. warrior. Things like poisoning or uh, uh, harming civilians. Uh, and so Cicero is very uh, cognizant of the role that honor uh, makes. And this is something that later uh, international relation theories, people like Grotius, when he talks about uh, just war, he'll also talk about honor. Uh, but in modern international relations, until very recently, uh, we've dropped out uh, the importance of, of honor as motivations within warfare. So this is a, an important theme, I think, that we can uh, recover and think with as we think about uh, justice in contemporary international relations. So let's talk about the other side of this, rights. Uh, in America, we have a Bill of Rights. In Rome, they don't have a written constitution at all, let alone a Bill of Rights. Um, but you've kind of discussed how this idea of rights is kind of like a very Christianized concept. Um, do Romans have rights? The Romans, I'm going to make start by making a distinction. And I'm going to make a distinction uh, between uh, natural rights, right. uh, rights that are pre-political, uh, that you hold simply by uh, virtue of being a human being, by having human dignity, uh, and uh, rights that are, are citizens' rights, mm -hmm. um, rights that you hold by virtue of being a citizen of a particular regime. Uh, in Rome, they had citizens' rights. Uh, and some of these rights uh, were even citizens' rights that were protected by a constitution. That is to say, they are deeply entrenched rights uh, that have been understood to accrue by custom over many, many generations, such that to violate those rights would be to deny something pretty fundamental about what it means to be a Roman citizen. So rights like this would be the right of appeal, mm -hmm. uh, provocatio, to appeal uh, uh, a, a charge against you uh, to a jury of your fellow citizens, or uh, suffragium, the right to vote. Uh, these are 
uh, citizens' rights, and uh, and they can't be easily abridged. Uh, and so you do have a claim uh, that you can hold against any current magistrate that would try to abridge these rights. So in that sense, uh, they are rights that you have an action or a claim against magistrates, uh, and they are not grounded simply in a prevailing political order. There's there's a type of history uh, behind it, a type of Roman history that you can draw on and appeal to uh, to defend your rights. Uh, but they're not pre pre political. They're not rights that stand outside of Rome right. uh, or Roman history uh, that are held simply based on your dignity or status. Uh, that language of rights uh, comes in uh, uh, much later. I would argue that uh, that type of rights, the very first time you see anything kind of close to that would be Lactantius, uh, who was a Christian author in the fourth century, uh, who uh, makes an argument in a work called The Divine Institutes mm -hmm. uh, that uh, all human beings, by virtue of bearing the image of God, uh, have a certain status. Uh, and this status is uh, not acquired, but it is received. It's inherent. We all have it. Uh, and therefore, in so much as you are a human being, you have, therefore, you bear the divine image. Therefore, you have a status. Uh, therefore, uh, th there are certain uh, things and freedoms that you have uh, and certain claims that you have uh, and certain um, uh, liberties and powers that you have. Uh, so that kind of, of right that's, a, a you might say, a natural right or a human right is a much later tradition uh, that even still was in a minority report until in the Middle Ages in canon law it becomes more important. And then, then finally, when you get into uh, uh, in, into uh, early modernity, this idea of human rights becomes very, very important. So, you know, so the Romans didn't have human rights uh, and they didn't have natural rights, uh, but they certainly had a, a deep con and important conception of citizens' rights. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy that you brought up this idea of citizenship because it's something that people talk so much about now. It's such an important concept. Um, and that Rome had actually a very kind of unique uh, view of within the ancient world. Um, I mean, the most you were talking about uh, privileges accorded to Roman citizens. One of the most famous examples is St. Paul, who they can't just kill him for being a troublemaker because he's a Roman citizen. And at that juncture in Roman history, that's still quite valuable. That carries a lot of power. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to ask a little bit about that um, because... You know, Rome is very uh, inclusive, I guess, compared to other places in terms of who they allow to be citizens. Um, is that, do they think of that kind of in the same way that we think of it, where anyone can kind of just apply to be a citizen? And is that sort of more open attitude um, in terms of the, you know, thousand years of Roman success? Is that attitude an advantage? How does it help them achieve that? Citizenship in Rome, I think, is gives us an opportunity to think about something that's very important, and, and that has to do with the founding of regimes and the mm. principles uh, of which regimes are founded. Uh, in, in a way, uh, we can understand uh, the political culture of regime uh, uh, based on its, its founding principles. And and I'll give you kind of an example in, in the myths that we tell about the founding. Mm. Uh, so in, in Athens, uh, for instance, uh, Athens, the founding myths is that a Athenians were octochthonous. That means they are sprung from the land of Attica. Uh, they are native born. Uh, and as a result, um, to be an Athenian uh, for parts of Athenian history, you had to have two Athenian parents and then later on one Athenian uh, parent. Uh, naturalization did not happen uh, in in Athens until uh, the fourth century. Uh, and even then, uh, our evidence suggests that it was open uh, to uh, mainly uh, foreign diplomats for political mm -hmm. reasons, maybe 400 or so. Uh, people were actually naturalized. It was a very small uh, thing, this expansion of citizenship, and, and for others who were outside of Athens to become an Athenian citizen. Rome is very different. Uh, Rome's uh, foundation myth uh, says that uh, the Romans came from, uh, from Troy, yeah. Uh, under Aeneas. Uh, and so they came from elsewhere. Uh, and then they uh, united in a group at Rome in which a, a lot of different tribes and villages uh, came together in one people. Uh, and so Rome, uh, both the city and the citizens from the beginning uh, were people who came from elsewhere. And so built into the story of Rome uh, is a type of, you might say, um, extension 
of citizenship. And Mary Beard uh, actually has has a book uh, where she tells the Roman history uh, from the beginning of Rome up until uh, the, the the third century uh, that just tells out that story about the expansion uh, of, of Roman citizenship all the way out. And, uh, and what we see generally uh, in painting in large strokes is that as citizenship expands, uh, it uh, becomes uh, – some parts of it stay the same and some parts get diluted. Uh, so what you have to be a citizenship at Rome is you have a couple of things. Number one, you have a status. Right. Uh, that status uh, means that you're, you're not a slave. Uh, you're not a – non-citizen. Uh, so it carries a certain type of status, certain type of uh, standing. Uh, second of all, citizenship, uh, some it's very complicated. Some Roman citizens had the vote, some didn't have the vote. Uh, but if you're a citizen with the vote, uh, then you certainly have uh, the right to vote. And then the third thing is you have uh, rights of uh, protection, such as you mentioned St. Paul, the mm -hmm. provocatio, this right, right of appeal, which is a citizen's right that would be one of those rights that I would say would be a fundamental constitutional right uh, that is deeply embedded with what it means to be a Roman citizen. Uh, so those are the kind of the three things. You have uh, the protective rights, you have the right to vote, uh, and then you have a type of standing. Uh, then as you move, as, as citizenship begins to be expanded, uh, and it became controversial at some periods uh, in, in Roman history. In uh, the first century, there was a whole war uh, that the allies waged. Uh, in order to claim uh, more citizenship uh, in, in different degree, greater degrees of citizenships for them. So, uh, so even in Rome as today, this question about who gets citizenship was a contentious right. uh, uh, issue. But as it begins to expand, uh, it begins to get diluted. And, you know, the more people that became citizens, uh, the less status, let's right. say, it brought you uh, to hold a citizen. So by Paul's day, uh, citizenship uh, brought with you uh, mainly legal protections, not quite as much status. And, and most citizens, of course, never voted uh, because you'd have to go to Rome uh, to vote. Uh, and as the empire got bigger, uh, that, that kind of political part of it uh, dropped out. Uh, finally, in, in, uh, you know, in the third century, uh, with Caracalla in, in 212, uh, there was an edict that, that made every single free person uh, or free man uh, in Rome uh, so everyone who wasn't a slave uh, by by one stroke, a citizen. And, um, you know, so so Rome was very happy to extend citizenship. Uh, but of course, uh, that edict by Caracalla wasn't self-interested. Uh, I don't think it was it right. was made out of cosmopolitan interest. Some people have suggested that, uh, that he was influenced by uh, by a jurist named Opian who was influenced by Stoicism, uh, and that this edict of extending citizenship throughout the, the world was was based on a type of humanitarian cosmopolitanism. I don't think that's right at all. I think, uh, you know, what this does is the more people who are citizens, that means, uh, you, you know, you get some things, but uh, such as legal protection, but you also, there's some uh, obligations, which is to support Rome uh, and fight for Rome and pay taxes to Rome. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so there's some things that that Rome gets, uh, as well as things that the that, that the the former subjects who are now citizens uh, would get. And one of the most important rights of being a citizen is voting, uh, which is one of those things that just affects every American citizen today. That, in a very serious way, was pioneered by the Romans. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, to me, one of the most kind of uh, important things kind of beneath the surface of voting is that the implication is that uh, about where authority rests, that authority itself, octoritas, rests with the people. Um, and, you know, when you dig a little bit below the surface in the Roman system, you immediately start to see kind of cracks in that foundation, I guess. Um, how true is that? And you know, is Rome, I think people draw kind of this fundamental distinction between, you know, representative republicanism like Rome and a democratic system like Athens. Um, is that distinction really true? Good. Well, there's there's a lot there, there's a lot there. There's two parts. I, 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 I'll take I'll take yeah. I'll take both parts. Uh, and I think by explaining the first part, uh, the, I'll set us up to talk about the second part. Yeah. Is the distinction between yeah. uh, a republic and a democracy really true? Yeah. Uh, so your first question, I think, has to do with the sovereignty of the people. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, one of the fullest, I don't want to say most historically accurate, but one of the fullest accounts of Rome and actually one of the most important for political theorists uh, of the Roman constitution is by Polybius. Polybius uh, was a Greek general who uh, in the second uh, century was fighting against 
Rome, and he was captured and, and held prisoner at Rome. And while he was at Rome, he uh, traveled around uh, with the House of Scipio, uh, which is a very illustrious uh, family. Uh, Scipio uh, himself was, was a general uh, for Rome. Uh, so he got to, to see the Roman political system uh, and the Roman army uh, up front uh, and close. And so he wrote a work, his histories, uh, is designed to uh, explain why did Rome uh, go from being a sleepy village, uh, one of many sleepy villages on, on, on in the Mediterranean world, a sleepy village in the banks of the Tiber, and, and go from one of just a small village to come to rule and dominate the Mediterranean world, and moreover, uh, suffering a great defeat uh, at the Battle of Cannae against Hannibal, uh, in which, uh, depending on which source you read, anywhere between 45 and, and 80,000 uh, Romans got uh, obliterated by yeah. Hannibal. And how did they overcome that uh, in order to uh, seize their dominance? And and Polybius's answer is the Roman constitution. Right. Uh, and he very famously uh, sets out in book six of the histories to explain what that constitution is. Uh, and he uses, because he's Greek, uh, <laughs> he uses Greek categories to try right. to capture the Roman constitution. And these categories uh, go all the way back to um, you, you find them in Herodotus and, and Plato and Aristotle, uh, where you you analyze constitutions by asking, uh, is the rule uh, by one, by few, and by by many, and then is the rule good that, or, or bad? And uh, and so he he analyzes the Roman Constitution in this uh, according to these terms, and um, he says, well, you know, it has a monarchical power because it has some consuls, uh, the two consuls that hold office uh, for a year, and and they they rotate annually, uh, and then there's the Senate, uh, and then and and that's the the aristocratic part of the Constitution, the rule by the by the few, and then the power of the people, the popular assemblies, uh, and that's the rule by the many. Uh, but then he says Rome goes further uh, than uh, most um, uh, explanations of the Constitution in, in Greek, uh, in that uh, he says the genius of the Roman Constitution is that there's a type of uh, of counterbalancing right. um, of these different parts within the Constitution. Uh, and we, we might pick up that a little later on if you want. But but for here, I think what's important is as he's describing the different parts of the Constitution, when he describes the people, the, the popular assemblies, he says that part is curios. It's, uh, it's lord. Uh, and, and sometimes translators understand that as sovereign. The people are sovereign. Mm. People have the sovereign power or, or authority. And often when we think about Republican government, it's, it's for government uh, by the people. Right. And that means the people has the power. The people has the sovereign power. Uh, and, and then you might say, well, is, is that the case? Did the people have the sovereign power? Well, on one hand, um, maybe, uh, you might say they have the sovereign power insofar as every single law passed in Rome, in Republican Rome, is passed by the people. The Senate right. can't make legislation. Only the people can popular assemblies. Uh, so that would seem that they are sovereign. On the other hand, uh, the popular assemblies um, are not uh, 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 accorded by the principle of one person, one vote. They're weighted right. by class. And uh, in, in the upper classes uh, have way more power, though they have fewer numbers. Right. Uh, also, what's interesting is the people themselves can't propose legislation. They can only vote yes or no right. to legislation that is put to them by a magistrate. Uh, the third thing is uh, they also can be, uh, their legislation can be repealed. Uh, and, and Cicero, actually, in one of his works, uh, invokes uh, the office of uh, uh, the augur. He says the augur, uh, in, in order to have a vote, you first have to, you know, see that the um, uh, that the auguries uh, portend um, favorable uh, conditions and that the gods are on your side. And he says, well, if the vote doesn't go the way you want, just uh, go back and retro retroactively uh, <laughs> say that the conditions were not uh, right and we'll overturn it uh, and we can appeal it. Right. Uh, so so uh, in one sense, the people have the authority over the laws. But of course, in another sense, uh, their authority is, is quite limited. Uh, compare that to something like Athens, where uh, at democratic Athens, uh, the people uh, could uh, vote. It was one person, one vote principle. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, the offices were held uh, 
uh, by uh, according to Lot. Uh, some of the offices were held according to Lot. Uh, so, so Rome certainly wasn't a, a democracy uh, in the sense that Athens was a was a democracy. Uh, and here, I do think Polybius was right in the sense that there was a type mm-hmm. of mixture uh, within the constitution or types of uh, uh, checks and balances within within the powers uh, that that um, made Rome uh, effective. Uh, so, so, so no, the people weren't. Uh, entirely sovereign, but uh, and yes, uh, Rome was different uh, than democratic Athens in I think a very significant way. Yeah, I'm happy that you brought up that passage from Polybius um, because I think it's one of those things where you read it and you're like, oh yeah, that's our system. The way that he describes kind of a mixed government and checks and balances, it all sounds directly out of everyone's AP US history textbook. Um, and one thing that you've talked about in the past that I find really interesting is ways in which Polybius might have kind of projected too much um, and might not have quite properly understood um, the way that Rome worked, uh, which is interesting because the founding fathers, I mean, relied really heavily on Polybius. And I, I'm sort of cheating a bit because I've already asked this question actually to Josh Ober, who was one of my former advisors, um, about kind of how the founding fathers might have properly or improperly understood the Roman example. Um, But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on ways in which the founding fathers kind of correctly looked at the ancient example or ways in which uh, the sources that they had might not have been accurate. I mean, maybe to our benefit. (laughs) Well, the founding fathers loved uh, Polybius. Uh, You know, this this famous account of the the compound constitution that we're talking about, the division of separation uh, uh, of checks and balances. Uh, But I should also say uh, that uh, one reason why they loved him so much is because uh, the work of his chief competitor uh, <laughs> uh, from Rome uh, did not survive intact, and that ah. would be Cicero's account on the Republic. Uh, and this was a, a work that the founding fathers longed uh, to see. They longed to have access to. Yeah. Uh, it, it survived in 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 some fragments uh, in uh, Lactantius, this uh, fourth century uh, Christian rhetorician I mentioned a little earlier ago in the context of of rights, uh, and also in St. Augustine's The City of God. Uh, so they had some fragments, and they wished they could have the whole work. And and John Adams, uh, our, our second president, uh, John Adams wrote a work, uh, actually, uh, the same, the spring uh, of uh, 1789, uh, the summer in which, of course, the Constitution was, was ratified. He wrote a work called A Defense of the, the uh constitutions of the government of the United States of America. And in this work, he says, the loss of Cicero's book upon republics is much to be regretted, as all the ages of the world have not produced a greater statesman and philosopher united in the same character. Mm. His authority should have uh, great weight. And one of my former students, Thomas Cole, who's a, who's a lawyer uh, in, in graduate school, wrote a wonderful paper that is published in Global in, uh, Intellectual History uh, that argues that he read Madison's notes. Uh, wow. on uh, at the Constitutional Convention, and he shows that these notes reveal that on the Republic, these fragments was discussed at the Constitutional Conventions, wow. and in particular, Cicero's attention to class dynamics, uh, something that is completely absent from Polybius's theory and account right. of the Roman Constitution, uh, but, but in, in Cicero, class matters. Uh, and and, uh, and Tom shows uh, that, that this attention to Cicero played a huge role in uh, their conversation about the need for two representative bodies uh, mm-hmm. that have different means uh, by which uh, representatives or senators were, you know, were, were chosen. So senators initially were ap- appointed by uh, right. the state uh, uh, legislatures. Right. Uh, so, so they loved Polybius, sure, uh, but, um, but partly that was because he benefited from history, uh, that they didn't have uh, enough of, of his rival account. Um, if I could quickly, yes. I didn't know that Polybius and Cicero were rivals. Yes. That's an interesting fact. What what was the area of disagreement? So most people think uh, that uh, you know that that Polybius that the sister was following Polybius in on the Republic. He certainly evokes Polybius, uh, but I think it, with a close reading, and I argue this in a book that I wrote in in 2013, and uh, there's a there's a paperback version uh, that was. Uh, that, that was published in 2020. That's much cheaper if you want to take it, <laughs> t- take a look at it and, and see if I'm right. Uh, but but I have argued uh, here that a close reading of Sisters on the Republic actually shows uh, that there's parts of 
uh, Polybius's account that Cicero is dissatisfied with. I mean, Polybius argues, uh, much as James Madison does right. uh, in the Federalist Papers, that um, – uh, that that human nature is is self interested, uh, and uh, that uh, what we should try to do is instead of trying to eliminate this self interest that would cause faction, the way let's say uh, Plato tried to do in his Republic, or the way like Curtius uh, tried to do uh, in in Sparta, what what you what, what you should actually try to do um, is uh, set up a system of checks and balances uh, so that ambition would counteract ambition, power would counteract uh, power, uh, and so you know Plato suggest that that's why the Romans were so good, uh, because it was based on the separation um, of, of powers. And what's necessary is to institutionalize a, a constitution in which uh, you have uh, an equivalence of power just distributed in, right, in such a way uh, so that the different powers within a constitution will try to uh, uh, conflict each other. And then that way you can use the ambition to be productive. Uh, and it was quite an ingenious uh, sort of theory uh, big, uh, by Polybius, because in the ancient world, uh, the the, what, what almost everyone thought, uh, certainly Plato thought this, uh, Aristotle to a lesser degree, um, uh, the Spartans thought this, uh, was that uh, the, the best way to deal with faction is to eliminate it, uh, and not to make it productive. Cicero had some questions this uh, sort of account. And he questions this because he wonders, is human nature as consistently uh, selfish and self-interested as uh, Polybius uh, suggests that it is? Uh, that's where he begins. Uh, is it as predictable as Polybius thought? Uh, and, and if it's not as predictable, which Cicero didn't think it was, uh, then can you really come out with a science of politics that will allow you to engineer a solution? Uh, and so uh, for Cicero, he puts much more attention on virtue uh, and he puts much more attention in class, uh, because again, if it's not just constitutional power, you have to think about the social condition. So that brings class into his analysis. And so for, for Cicero, his constitution truly is a mixed constitution, which right. every class and every interest has their weights. He, he aims more for blending than opposition. Uh, and, um, and, and then, of course, if you have a blended constitution, it's very important to have wise and competent statesmen, leaders, uh, who are able uh, to mix the blending to the right level. Uh, so for Cicero, uh, his account of a Republican constitution uh, would have much more emphasis on virtue, much more emphasis on wise statesmanship, uh, and much more emphasis on attention uh, to uh, all of the affairs of the people, uh, rather than saying that we can simply uh, engineer a constitution mm -hmm. that can work pretty good uh, even uh, largely, not ex not entirely, but largely in the absence of, of virtue. Mm. I know. Well, I'm sorry, I cut you off before the part of the story where we found out that they actually recover that yes. <laughs> recover that text from Cicero. Um, but yeah, could you finish what you're saying yeah. earlier? So, so they recover the text from Cicero. Yes. So, so, so that was just a, a helpful. Uh, 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 you know, it's always nice to be able to shout out one of your students, and so that's that's I, I think. Yeah. Uh, so that's a an important counter uh, perspective. But what I want to do, I think, is let's do a test case uh, right. on. Let's put one of the founders of the test yeah. and see how well. Uh, he he understood um, he understood uh, the Romans and and the founder that I'm going to choose is it's not going to be Madison but but it's going to be uh, one of his fellow writers of the Federalist Paper Alexander Hamilton okay. uh, Alexander Hamilton in Federalist Nine and Federalist Nine is uh, is is a fascinating um, uh, work uh, obviously it's not as famous as you know for instance Federalist Ten Federalist Fifty One those by Hamilton but if you want to read carefully one of the Federalist Papers with respect to the ancient war, to how uh, the founders would have seen the ancients, and especially the Romans, this is a great one to read. Uh, it begins, actually, being a little bit condescending. Uh, Hamilton's a bit condescending towards both the Romans and the Greeks, and it begins like this. He says, it's impossible to read the history of the petty republics of Greece and Italy without feeling sensations of horror and disgust right. <laughs> at the distractions with which they were continually agitated and at the rapid successions of revolutions by which they were kept in a state of perpetual vibration between the extremes of tyranny and anarchy. If momentary rays of glory break free from the gloom, while they dazzle us with a transient and fleeting brilliancy, they at the same time admonish us to lament that the vices of government should pervert the direction and tarnish the luster of those bright talents and exalted endowments. 
uh, for which the favored soils that have produced them have been so justly celebrated. So there he suggests that uh, that perhaps we don't want to go uh, back uh, to to Rome. Yeah. Uh, that that Greece and Rome are more anti models uh, than than models. Mm. Uh, and, and then he goes and he says. Um, I'm going to give you some proposals uh, that the ancients didn't know. He says uh, the, the principles that uh, are undergirding uh, the, the new constitution that we're arguing for um, were <clears throat> not known at all or imperfectly known to the ancients. And what are these principles mm -hmm. that were either not known at all or imperfectly known to the Romans? Um, they are the regular distribution of power into distinct departments. Um, uh, the introduction of checks and balances, legislative checks and balances, uh, courts composed of judges holding their offices during good behavior, uh, the representation of the people in the legislature by deputies of their own elections. He says all of these are either whole discover wholly new discoveries or have made their principal progress towards perfection in modern times. Well, let's see how Hamilton did. Let's put him to the test and, yeah. and see. Um, how, how well he did. So, uh, so the first of these is a separation of power. Uh, uh, well, you know, we just spent some time talking about Polybius uh, mm -hmm. and the separation of powers. Uh, Polybius understood the Senate and the people and the consuls all to have different powers. The consuls, for instance, they had the power to use military force, but only the Senate can declare war. So the checks and balances. Uh, the people have the whole, have the sole legislative power to make laws. Uh, but of course, they can only be convened by uh, a magistrate, a council or somebody like that. Uh, so there are separation of powers in Roman thought uh, and, and in Roman constitutional analysis. Well, how about an independent judiciary? Well, here I think this is almost entirely new. Uh, at Rome, judiciaries were formed from the people. Later on, they had standing courts. Uh, Cicero, uh, fascinatingly, fascinatingly, in one of his speeches uh, on behalf of Caecina, um, argues for something that legal scholars will call the autonomy of law. And then you might say something like an independent judiciary was a principle that came from that. Uh, but this in this principle, certainly, of the autonomy law is uh, a bedrock of uh, the uh, American legal system. Uh, but it was not... Uh, you know, it was articulated in theory, but it wasn't deeply, deeply practiced. Uh, and, and so I would say, yes, this is he's right on this one. Uh, an independent judiciary is, is, is mostly new. It's a modern thing. Mm -hmm. uh, how about the third thing? Elected representatives, uh, either directly by the people themselves or indirectly by other uh, elected officials. And this, I would say, is complicated. Uh, I'll talk you through it. Uh, first, Rome didn't understand elected representation in the way that, that Madison uh, would argue for later in the Federalist Papers. Uh, that is to say, elective representatives serve as delegates uh, mm -hmm. to vote according to the will of their uh, of their uh, represent uh, uh, to will their constituents, and so Madison says, you know, uh, if the people, uh, one of the safeguards against the tyranny of the legislature, uh, le legislators, is that if they vote their own way, you vote them out because they're right. supposed to represent you. So it's the idea of a delegation. Uh, you're supposed to vote the will of your constituents. Uh, of course, there's other ways, though, of understanding representation. Some people understand representation as a trustee. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this sense, you understand that uh, representatives, uh, magistrates, other officials uh, make the decision for the good of the people, but not necessarily as the people themselves would have voted. Right. So Edmund Burke, for instance, very famously argues for this idea of the people as uh, as a trustee. And, and so in this latter sense, people, the trustees, I do think you could speak about representation at Rome kind of in this sense. Um, not, not legislators. Uh, they didn't serve as representatives in the sense of being trustees because uh, that Roman legislature legislation was passed uh, by the people directly. So there was no need uh, for this kind of representative. Um, uh, so, so in this sense, uh, no, they really didn't have representation only in some more expansive sense. And that you should say that good government, uh, you know, the legislation and decisions should be be making on behalf of the uh, of the will of the people of the whole. Uh, so maybe you could think about uh, representation in some way uh, as a trusteeship uh, or maybe possibly there was an office called uh, the tribunate uh, and the tribunate uh, certainly uh, were meant to stand in uh, for the people. But again, uh, they weren't uh, necessarily passing legislation on behalf of the people. So uh, so here, uh, what would I say for Hamilton? How do you do? Well, I would say that on a separation of, of powers, he was he was mostly wrong, uh, you know, that that they did have a theory of the separation of powers. Uh, he was right on the independent judiciary. And I think he was 
I, I think we can say he was right on elected representation, certainly mm-hmm. in the way in which Madison was arguing uh, for representation. So I would say he gets at least an A minus on the Romans. Uh, <laughs> it, it, today, with, with the great inflation, we might even be able to give him an A, <laughs> but certainly an A minus. <laughs> And I'm, I'm really happy that you read that quote from Hamilton because it makes me feel like I'm not going crazy sometimes when I look at the ancient record and there's very much this uh, there's this thought, I guess, from people who don't look at the details that closely that, oh, it was so stable. You know, there's this Republican system that lasted for 500 years. And in fact, for a lot of uh, the so-called compromises that allowed it to last, quite a lot of blood was shed. Um, This was not such a peaceful way of resolving conflict, Um, and particularly class conflict, which you also brought in in the way that you talk about Polybius versus Cicero. Um, Yeah, class conflict is something that we like to pride ourselves as Americans of having less of, but which is very much bubbling to the surface today. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that in Rome, why Rome was so riddled with class conflict that for the Republican period, practically every conflict that you look at is really one class being upset with another um, and how they dealt with it. Well, I think, you know, I mentioned before you could tell Rome's story in terms of the expansion of citizenship as, as Mary Beard did. I mean, another way of telling the story of, of Rome uh, from its beginning on down is is trying to manage uh, conflict yeah. and in particular trying to manage uh, violence. And, and, yeah. and this goes all the way from, from Rome's founding, uh, which was founded in fratricide in which Romulus yeah. uh, uh, kills his brother Ramus, uh, to the founding of the Republic uh, in which uh, you have in uh, the early 6th century, uh, traditionally understood as 509, uh, you have uh, the uh, a nobleman's uh, wife, Lucretia, being raped by uh, the son of the king that led to the overthrow. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and then you have uh, the first century uh, BC is a, a time of civil war yeah. uh, that then ends only uh, with the... Um, uh, when one person, Augustus, uh, someone who would late uh, Octavian, who would later be called Augustus, uh, took uh, control and issued in a period of peace. Uh, so you you can tell the story of Rome all the way from the from its beginning uh, through monarchy, uh, through republic, uh, and then back again uh, into um, uh, in, in, into violence and conflict. And an important part of this conflict uh, uh, did involve class. And this particularly uh, became an important uh, part uh, in, in the first century, in the second century even. And, and maybe I'll pull out one example here. Uh, and that's a, a, a very famous example from the second century. Uh, and it's... Uh, uh, some reforms that were proposed by uh, the brothers Gracchus, by Tiberius right. Gracchus in the late 130s BC. Uh, and uh, and basically, Rome owned a lot of public land, land that's confiscated from, from enemies uh, in, in conquest. Uh, and this land could be held and worked by Roman citizens. Uh, and many wealthy citizens worked and profited from uh, vast quantities of this land. And Tiberius believed that an earlier set of laws uh, that had been passed limited the amount of land that any one citizen, citizen should hold. And so he passed legislation uh, that would redistribute this public land uh, to landless citizens. And, and his legislation had pretty strong popular appeal, but it brought Gracchus into conflict with the majority of the Senate. Mm. Uh, And the law passed the assembly only after another tribune. And you remember, tribunes were supposed to represent the interests of the people, uh, and in particular, the the, the plebs, the the poor people. Uh, He vetoed uh, that uh, against uh, the interests of the people. Uh, Mm. And Gracchus then um, removed his fellow tribune from from office. and, and then the story ends that in spite of being a tribune, which implied uh, that he was sacrosanct, uh, Gracchus was killed in a riot led by Scipio, uh, who was a, formal consul, a former consul from a family of patrician descent. So we have all kinds of things mixed up here. Uh, we, you know, the, the legislation will only fail, but we have all kinds of things mixed up. We have class that's mixed up. Uh, we have a conflict uh, within, uh, you know, the, the constitutional order. And, and you might say, well, would, would things have gone better if Rome had a written constitution? Um, and, um, and, and of course, Rome did have a constitution. It wasn't written. Right. Um, there, it had a set of statutes and laws and customs and rights that, you know, over time came to have a, a particular uh, force that were entrenched. Uh, and so they can't be set aside very easily. And, um, and, and, 
And so in the case of Tiberius Gracchus, norms of behaviors that were supposed to lead co to compromise among the elite were set aside. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, they're set aside by Octavius, uh, the opposition tribune who was supposed to protect the rights of, of the poor people, of the common people, but instead thwarted their vote. Uh, they were set aside by Tiberius, who responded by deposing Octavius, and then by, by Scipio, who responded by putting Tiberius to death. Uh, so this whole story is one of, uh, of class warfare that led to increased esca escalation yeah. uh, that ended in, in violence. And um, and maybe codifying codifying these norms uh, with penalties for their violation uh, at some step uh, at some period would have helped, but it only would have helped uh, if they were if they were enforced. Um, on the other hand, I think you might be able to argue uh, that a uh, written constitution wouldn't have helped and maybe would have led to a more uh, violent first century. Yeah. Um, after all, the initial dispute was over uh, the interpretation of a written statute. Which, of course, happens all the time, right. you know, in our own uh, system with a written constitution. Uh, moreover, uh, Rome uh, survived as long as uh, so long as a republic over 500 years precisely because it had a flexible constitution. And in one of the, the criticisms of uh, the American constitution is that it's very hard to amend. It's one of the, the two right. or three hardest constitutions in the world to amend. Uh, so, you know, we, we've had over 11,000 proposed amendments in our history and only 27 of them, right. including that the Bill of Rights have succeeded. And so some scholars have argued that uh, this uh, the difficulty required to amend the Constitution has contributed to the great importance that the judiciary plays in American right. politics, right. the least dangerous branch, uh, which uh, which in some ways escalates uh, conflict, including caste, class conflict, because if you can't amend the Constitution, then how you interpret it uh, matters deeply. Uh, right. Whereas Rome, uh, the, the, the way this was supposed to be handled uh, was through a, a set of customs, uh, deeply embedded customs that uh, that the elite would 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 follow, uh, and these became increasingly set aside uh, until you know ultimately I think that the, the the most dramatic of these setting aside uh, was when Caesar crossed the Rubicon and right. marched at Rome, uh, leading to uh, the very dramatic civil war against against Pompey uh, the Great. Well, I think that we're starting to hit time here, unfortunately, which is a shame because I have so many more questions that I want to ask. Um, but I wanted to close us off here. I think part of the reason why. The Roman Empire sustains such interest, um, and you know we project so much of our own politics onto Rome. Um, is that people feel that we live in quite uh, unstable times? Um, people make the case often that we're living at the end of the empire, especially because a plague played such a part in that, um, and we just had a really large plague, um, or the end of the Republic um, with kind of in, you know this increasing escalation of what types of norms it's uh, acceptable to violate. Um, so do you think either of those comparisons is a fair or interesting one, or uh, are we just being paranoid? Well, we're being American. Yeah. <laughs> we're being American. And, and, and what I mean from that is America has always seen Rome as an aspiration and a model. Yeah. Uh, Rome threw off monarchy to become a republic. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, but, but Americans have also... Uh, looked back uh, at at Rome as a warning because then Rome lost its Republican government and became right. a monarchy again under the empire be, before losing the empire and being absorbed into medieval uh, fiefdoms. And just as Rome lost its, its liberty, so could America. So let Rome be a warning. And, and Americans from the very beginning uh, uh, have, have, have seen Rome uh, as both uh, a, a, a warning uh, and also a, a model of, of inspiration. And, um, and so... Uh, so there is something uh, a reflex here. I think that that to, to, to see Rome as models that is deeply American, and 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 of course uh, Rome has never be an exact model because there was there's a book that was written a number of years ago that that, that asked the question, "Are we Rome?" Uh, in a sense, you know, well, no, we're not Rome. Uh, uh, we we have a different founding, a different constitutional order, a different political culture. Uh, you know, after all, I, I gave I gave Hamilton at least an A minus, right. uh, which me and he says that we're not Rome, right. uh, and. and so so neither of those parallels are going to be exact, uh, whether it's the parallel to the empire or uh, to uh, the republic. Um, and in some ways, it depends on what what you want to what you want to pick out. I mean, if if you want to emphasize certainly the republic. Uh, and and I do think here there there might be one that that I think would be apt uh, to pick out. Uh, and, and maybe I'll close with this: uh, mm -hmm. uh, a person I spent a lot of time thinking on is Cicero. Yeah. Uh, and and Cicero, 
um, was was very concerned with trying to save the republic. And what he was very concerned about in his day uh, was uh, was uh, class warfare and the failure of the elite. Yeah. And 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 for him, he he realized that republican government, a government that's going to sustain itself, needs to be a government where those who rule have the interests of the whole people in in mind uh, from whatever uh, backgrounds. And in an age uh, today that is extremely uh, 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 populist, uh, for instance, uh, is, I think, one in which uh, we uh, might uh, might, might reflect on on Cicero's solution. Uh, you know, certainly populism arises from many motivations, and there's yeah. lots of different grievances. It's a complex movement with many voices. But but some of the yearnings uh, that give rise to populism, I think, are important and get ignored uh, by by our elite. Uh, so there's a, a photojournalist, uh, Chris Arnade, uh, who published a book called Dignity: yeah. Seeking Respect in Back Row America, and it's a very moving book. Yeah. He captures the texture of the lives of the urban poor, the rural poor. Uh, people who too often are, are nameless. And he goes to places uh, that hold these urban and rural communities together, but simply don't aren't part of the fabric of the lives of, of our elite. Places like McDonald's's and, and houses of, of worship. And, and Arnade aims to highlight folks who have been ignored by, by many uh, of the elite. He calls these people back row America. And this ignorance shows up in our policies. Uh, for instance, in my home state of, of North Carolina, uh, the average life expectancy in Orange County, uh, where the University of Chapel Hill is and where many Duke professors live, is nine years longer than wow. in rural counties, such as Robeson County, North Carolina. Um, which is incredible and deserves our attention if our rule, if the rules of those in, those in power are to be seen as in the interest of the good of the whole people. Uh, and when life expectancy has that much disparity, uh, um, those who think that they are being ignored uh, by those in power, I think, have, have good evidence maybe to suggest that that might be uh, the, the case. And, and so the polls that suggest that we have increasing lack of trust in, um, in, in our uh, role – I think may reflect a type of loss of attention to the common good. So ultimately, Cicero responds to this by saying uh, that the elite need to be better. Those who rule need to be better. They need to define their actions and responsibilities uh, by their purpose as magistrates, which is to rule in the interests of all the people, to respond to the needs of the people as a whole. And I would say uh, that, that that kind of lesson at the end of the Roman Republic might be, if I had to choose one, might be the most important. Uh, I think that, um, that out of the many uh, ways in which we might look to Rome for inspiration and for warnings. I think that having a better, more responsive elite, I think, is one one piece, but an important piece of ensuring the perpetuation of our republic and its institutions. Well, thank you so much for that, Jed. And I know the example of Cicero in, in many ways is such a sad one uh, because, I mean, he's the most famous Roman statesman probably ever, and he's writing kind of in the death throes of the republic. Um, and does not die a happy death. Um, but I'm really grateful that you brought up that example and so grateful for your time. This has been so well, it's it's been a pleasure. And so we don't end on a on a downer. <laughs> no, no, I sorry. I will say, I will add this. Uh in, in the in Plutarch in his life of Cicero, he gives a great example of uh, Augustus. Uh and of course August the Emperor Augustus, when he was still Octavian, uh, he signed off on on Anthony and his henchmen putting to death Cicero. Yeah. And 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 um, and Augustus's nephew, uh, he he comes across his nephew reading a work of of Cicero's, uh, and he he walk in. He sees his uncle comes up to him, and he tries to hide it under his coat. He's afraid because, after all, he knew that his uncle was complicit in Cicero's death. And and he, he and, and Augustus takes the book from him, and he looks at it, and he reads some lines, and he says, uh, "He says, son, uh, that was a wise man and a lover of his country." Yeah. Uh, and so Cicero's death was unhappy, uh, but he bequeathed something, a way of thinking about uh, government, and and thought that 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 while it lived him, uh, and the work that I was uh, concluding on, where he. Thinks about how to reform our elite. Uh, his mm-hmm. On Duties was the second book off the printing press after only wow. after only the Bible. Uh, so it shows ways in which uh, to try to think well uh, and hard about our times in our, our government, uh, to try to live and act virtuously. Uh, uh, those writings and actions and impacts that we make may have an impact on others far beyond our own time and place. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Jed. That's absolutely amazing. And thank you for, for uh, curing my impulse to end on a, on a depressing note. So thank you again. Well, uh, thank you, Anik. <laughs> it's been wonderful to have this conversation with you. 
Well, Madisonians, there you have it, Professor Jed Atkins of Duke Classics on Roman politics. His book on the subject is in the show notes, as is his most recent lecture at the Madison Program, which is on the Christian origin of tolerance. It's very different from this conversation, but also very interesting, so I would definitely recommend checking it out. As always, if you want to find out more about the Madison Program, you can find us at jmp.princeton.edu. This contains all of our recorded lectures and all of our upcoming events. You can also join our mailing list, look at our summer offerings, and see what kind of work we do here on Princeton's campus. You can also follow us on social media, on Twitter, at Madison Program, as well as on Instagram and Facebook. And finally, if you enjoyed this podcast, please do leave us a rating and a review. It really does help us so much. Thank you again for listening. Welcome again to 2024, and I'm so excited to see you next time here on Madison's Notes. Mm-hmm.